which is absolutely fine. But I think we'll get going. Uh, we're just past the hour and uh, we've got a fair bit to cover this evening, as always. And I want to allow plenty of time for people to come into this discussion. We're actually joined by a good number of people who are not currently, I should say, 7030 ambassadors, um, which is lovely. Um, so I wonder if we could just take a quick moment to have those of you who are not volunteers for 7030, uh, just, or I should say, if you are joining the call as a 7030 ambassador for the first time this evening, if everybody uh, new to the call could just very quickly introduce themselves to the rest of uh, the attendees, and then we'll begin our discussion this evening. Who would like to go first? I could go first. Please do. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Minna Jonk Bayer. I'm an award winning early years author and a PhD researcher. My passion is the neuroscience of early brain development and early childhood trauma. Um, to offer up a bit of a personal perspective, I am, you know, a first hand uh, experiencer of those ACEs, and I just feel it's critically important for early years practitioners and teachers and any professional working with children to understand the impact of trauma and how that manifests on a day-to-day -day basis, because I am seeing and hearing a lot of uh, mislabeling and judging of children. And I think it's unacceptable. I think it's thwarting their ability to thrive and, and we need it to stop. But unless early years, uh, qualifications and training start embedding the neuroscience of early brain development and trauma, I think we will still keep disservicing too many children and that's my passion and that's why I signed up to the 7030 campaign. Thank you, Mine. Who else have we got on for the first time this evening? Like next, um, I'm Pauline Byrne and I'm currently National Lead for Allied Health Professions um, working in children and young people's services at Scottish Government. Um, I'm passionate about adversity and passionate about supporting allied health practitioners, so speech and language therapy, dietitians, um, occupational therapists to work collaboratively with early years practitioners, children and their families. Um, to support resilience and create buffers to adversity. Thank you, Pauline. Hi, it's Yvonne and Elspeth here. We are uh, both early years, uh, uh, early years nurture practitioners in an area of high deprivation. Um, and obviously, through nurture, we do a lot of the ACs and we uh, felt that this was uh, very informative for us to join in on and I'd like to find out more about the actual campaign itself. Uh, so that's who we are. Thank you Yvonne and Elspeth. It's really lovely to have you on. Um, and with regards to kind of learning more specifically about the campaign, there may be things that you learn from this call, I'm sure there will be, but but you may find that um, given this, this discussion is particularly focused on early years, um, that, that a wider discussion needs to be had between the three of us, uh, j just to just to get to the, the nitty gritty around the campaign itself. So um, forgive me if we don't answer all your questions about the campaign on this call. Um, but as I say, we can we can follow that up. Colette and Dave yeah. said that they can't hear anything. Is everybody else okay hearing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes I can hear. All right. Yeah, all good. Okay, so there's something going wrong on that end then. Um, let Dave, I'm not sure what's going on in, on your end there, but just make sure, um, I don't think you guys need headphones. Mm -hmm. I, I hope you can get it sorted. Um, type in the, the, the message box if you're still struggling in a few minutes time and we'll see if I can help you. I want to kind of get into this discussion quite quickly. Um, I'm just gonna very quickly, and I mean quickly, go over the basics, which are, uh, throughout this discussion, we've got 22, 23 people joining us this evening. So uh, there could be a lot of background noise. In order to avoid that, uh, can I please ask that anybody who is not speaking um, at, at any given moment, just make sure you're muted. Uh, and, and there's a really quick and easy way to do that. If you're on a computer or a laptop, which I think most of you are, 
Uh, you've got your microphone icon up the top of the screen. If it's green, you are not muted, so you can be heard. If it's orange, uh, you are muted and can't be heard. And you just need to click on that icon to mute and unmute. If you're on telephone, it's star six to mute and star six again to unmute. So if you're not speaking, please make sure you are muted so we can avoid any background noise. This call is being recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's uploaded onto our YouTube channel for our uh, supporters to listen back to and also for those ambassadors who are not able uh, to join us this evening. We have a few different guests coming on and I did mention in my last email earlier today, uh, we were due to be uh, joined by uh, three ladies who um, together are leading on an initiative uh, called the Early Years Wellbeing Week. Um, and it's this week here, it started uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, this is the first time I believe that this, is, this initiative is taking place. Um, it's a fantastic idea. It's it's mainly happening on Twitter, I should say. For those of you who are not on Twitter, you maybe haven't heard of it, um, aside from my, my email. Um, so we were due to be joined by them. All three at different times ended up having to uh, drop out for different reasons, unfortunately. So we've taken a slight different approach to this call than, uh, than I planned for. That said, we are going to be joined by some fantastic guests and uh, some have already introduced themselves. Um, and I really want to allow for anybody and everybody to contribute to this discussion this evening. So I, I'm, I'm keen for the guests to get an opportunity to share their work and to share their thoughts, particularly on the role of early years and early year work um, in preventing and addressing adverse childhood experiences. But I really encourage you all to come in on this and, and let's have a really dynamic and animated conversation around early years. So always we've got our hashtag uh, for those of you on social media. It's hashtag 7030TalksAces. And you can tag us on Twitter and Facebook at 7030Campaign. And here are our guests. Uh, so Lil, I'm not sure, has actually managed to join us. Uh, she may be coming on a little bit later if she's not already on. Lil, please correct me if I'm wrong. Certainly, our top three guests there are on, and as I say, some have uh, already. Uh, <laughs> We've got a fair bit of background noise going on. So, um, as I say, this evening's call, early years, the role of early years, and 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 what we can do with early years in mind to better prevent and address adverse childhood experiences, and of course, the the focus of our campaign, the seventy thirty campaign being child maltreatment, child abuse and neglect. Um, and I want to welcome whoever would like to begin this conversation around early years to do so, and we'll take it from there. Hi, it's Tracy Ratcliffe here. Hi, Tracy. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly, thank you. That's grand. Um, thank you so much for inviting us this evening. I've been very excited about this all day. Um, just to get the conversation going, I'll give you a little bit of um, background as to why I wanted to join in this evening. Um, in Fife, um, I am the lead for early intervention and prevention. And so part of my role is around looking at the early years, around looking at preventing cases and looking around that collaborative working and how we can actually support families and those closest to the families. And I'm very fortunate at the moment in being involved in a literacy practicum from Scottish Government with um, Pauline, another of our guests who's online this evening. And part of our, our role is um, looking at projects around attainment and within that for children to attain, obviously we need to be looking at prevention of ACEs, about promoting nurture, about promoting well-being. So we've been involved in a, a small project, like a small test of change with a local nursery where we know the children are experiencing adverse childhood experiences. They have been referred into um, the under threes nursery provision. So um, due to concerns being raised by health visitors. So we're doing a lot of work alongside the nursery staff um, to try and support families in terms of building those relationships through play, um, through interactions. And there's a lot of nice um, skill sharing opportunities going on there. Because um, as Pauline has mentioned before, in terms of the ACEs and prevention of this, you know, this is not something that 
any one profession or any one area can do on their own. It is very much a, a thing that we have to do together. We have to look at how we can share our skills, etc., and work on this collaboratively. So I'm quite excited to be part of the conversation this evening. I see. And I know, um, like you said, the, the, the kind of key focus for you in terms of specifically looking around early years, uh, I think there's three, aren't there? There's collaborative working, like you say, skill sharing and, and this work around early intervention and prevention. Um, so to lead on from, from, from that opening then, uh, when we're talking about collaborative working, what isn't working at the moment around that and what needs to be done to better make sure that people are collaboratively working? This is it's certainly a big area of challenge. Um, at the moment, you know, you, we have a challenge of there's many professions working within the professional silos and everybody's doing their little bit and their little thing. But in terms of that crossover, that skill sharing, it's not happening as much as we would like and it, it's developing in some areas but it's something we most definitely want to be working on and evidencing that actually this is something that this is the best way forward um, and for example within the practicum i'm involved there's somebody from education there is somebody who is a health visitor there's somebody who's a speech and language therapist and myself as an occupational therapist and basically what we are trying to do is pull together the best bits of our knowledge that we can share that are going to we feel will have the biggest impact to supporting these families and to supporting the staff as well. So it's that sharing of knowledge. So we're not expecting people to be OTs and speech and language therapists, but it's getting that dilution almost of our skills that's good enough to make a difference. I think what can actually, you know, get in the way of that sometimes is, you know, people do get a bit professionally scared about their skills and giving away some of their knowledge, if that makes sense. Can I interject? I think you've made a really important point there about being professionally scared, especially from an earliest perspective. I've spoken to so many practitioners who haven't been enabled or encouraged to share their opinions on, on a child's well-being or development because, because of the fact that they are early years and it doesn't seem to count until things do go wrong. But really, they're at the forefront of this practice and, and they are seeing these children on a daily basis but for some reason still their voices are not being heard as they should be and information therefore isn't being shared in a meaningful way and I think we need to work on it you know in, in equipping our practitioners to be more confident and, and give them the skills to share that information because I think it can be critical And Mini, on just on, on skills then, uh, would you like to say a little bit about your training programme? Well, oh, um, I mean, it's been, a, it's been a long time coming. I think as a student on the foundation degree in early years, back when I was 20, and then being a, a lecturer in FE and HE for the past 18 or so years, I realised time and time again, no matter where I taught, the fundamentals of early brain development and trauma were not touched upon. They weren't touched upon. And it was only one black A4 handout that I was given on a birth to three module when I was 20 that just, you know, led me to have a light bulb moment. I was like, oh my God, wow, this is what we need, where we need to be heading. And I just think, you know, in terms of, and then I thought, right, well, you know, I, I tried to voice my opinion in different forums and it wasn't really being heard. I thought, OK, I'm going to write a book about it. I'm going to write a book about the neuroscience of early child development and well-being. And the irony there was that I needed to write this with a neuroscientist because who am I at the end of the day? I'm an early years practitioner. This neuroscientist left the project very early on, stating that he didn't know what a book like mine would have to offer early as practitioners. And here we are a year on, it's won the award, you know, I'm not saying it for that reason, but it's now required reading across so many universities and colleges and practitioners and students are like, are getting it. They understand the meaning it has in their daily practice. And this is where I want us to be heading. So. After that, I thought a natural progression from that would be to develop online training of my own to bridge that knowledge gap that I am currently exploring as part of my doctoral research. And 
the um, the program is a four module online program endorsed by cash is an, an official cash product if you like I don't like the term product and it looks at the the stages of early brain development the impact that we have on that very precarious process it looks at the impact of adverse childhood experiences there are a lot of uh, real life case studies from social care workers from members of the police force to occupational play therapists and neuroscientists just to bring it alive and to give it some real context and it's it's being really well received from Ofsted inspectors teachers childminders alike and it's it's showing me that people are hungry for this knowledge especially those from an earlier background but we are not equipped to go anywhere or do anything about it and I'm currently collaborating with cash the leading earlier uh, training provider to start revising their qualifications and training offers with regard to the neuroscience of early brain development and, and trauma because it has to be at the top of the agenda but my bugbear is until the government the department for education the Ofsted realize this in a meaningful way then we are still going to be struggling to meet these children's needs And when we say a meaningful way, what do we mean? I mean to give time and space for attachment, for connection, not to be rushing after those academic outcomes all the time. It should they've got it upside down. When we look at the work of the eminent neuroscientist Dan Siegel, and he talks about the downstairs, upstairs brain, you know, the downstairs brain the emotional brain if you like we have to keep that in check we need to make sure that's okay before we expect so much of children academically spelling tests math tests you know all the you know the sats the baseline it's too much have we checked in how are you feeling where are you at what's home like really there isn't enough time given to this in our in our settings and i see it being funnel down to early years increasingly and, and it needs to stop. We have very similar um, discussions within occupational therapy in terms of you know, obviously academic for, you know, for years you know the say oh, children are struggling to engage in the curriculum and there's been a variety of reasons behind that in terms of their their motor skill development their sensory processing difficulties etc cetera, etc cetera. but when you you start pulling back differences and then you look at the, the very early years for the children that we're talking about the more vulnerable children in society everything's going to be impacted if, if we don't have that strong nurturing start to life you know in terms of the, the, the development of skills needed for learning we need to get that well-being in place and we've spent a lot of time with the nursery that we are working with as our pilot site and uh, looking at the importance of play in developing nurture relationships and um, the importance of uh, interactions and communication and promoting nursing and um, nurturing relationships and just trying to pull everything back to that very basic you know that nice interaction between the EYO and the child to support the parent to have those nice nurturing interactions and just to start trying to encourage them on a regular basis and we're not expecting you know great big changes but what we're trying to do is support the EYOs to support the families to engage in simple strategies and using resources that we already have in the play at home book in terms of those nice activities and nice play opportunities for children to have those opportunities of play that will help them build the resilience and begin to build those buffers for development. I think that's absolutely critical. You've hit upon two big points for me, the importance of play and resilience. But how many parents are we encouraging and equipping to understand the importance of these concepts? Society, childhood today, it's fleeting and it's pressed upon it from so many directions. You know, tech is another issue for me. Here, have this while I'm on my mobile phone. Play with this. Where's the engagement? What do parents understand about the importance of this engagement? There are so many wonderful online resources out there from zero to three and of course the Wave Trust. But how many parents have access to these? You know, and also then how does that filter through into the earliest settings in the schools? 
I see from a perspective of a parent as well as an early years uh, professional, it's all about academic outcomes, spelling tests, phonics tests, maths tests. If you haven't done well on this, it's a yellow card. And it's absolutely, I mean, it would be ridiculous had it not been so detrimental. My child is sick. She comes home in tears because she's scared she's done something wrong. She's scared to put her foot out of place, literally. And, and these are very young children. What happened to, and I'm going to say it again, I'll probably say it 10 times more, connecting. Time to be. Time to explore relationship. Time to explore their surroundings. Not dictated by adults and their outcomes, but actually what they are interested in because once we get what children are interested in and what is preoccupying them then that's half the battle if you like but we're not doing that we're forcing them into situations and activities that actually aren't fit for a lot of them and a lot of the reasons are because they come from troubled backgrounds from chaos in the home and then they come into school and you expect them to sit down do this listen to this don't do that otherwise you're going to see the head teacher and this is quite you know what a lot of parents feed back to me and it's not that oh you know we don't we don't have enough child um, school ready children it should be how child ready are our schools and they are not it's sub victorian academic heavy and it just doesn't fit children today yeah can i say something please um, can i just um, i was listening to what you were saying about um you know not just the professionals understanding about attachment but also the parents and i was wondering it's janice sorry it's janice saunders um i was just wondering whether you'd have much um, contact with the solely hull approach because um much. Yeah, okay, so that's one I think is worth people looking at because um, it can be, it, it, you know, professionals can go upon on it and, and they call it the Soli Hull approach. It was developed by the health services in Soli Hull, but it's now certainly throughout England. I can't comment on Scotland. Um, and it's also they did, the group work is very, very good and it does um, address. I mean, it doesn't solve every problem, but it is very, very good at um, addressing uh, what lies behind um, parenting questions, things like sleep and Could you, so on. Anyway, that's the suggestion. I, I just okay. wanted to ask, this is Lorelei. I, this is the first time I've been on this call. I just wanted to ask if you could repeat the name of that approach. I didn't quite okay. it, it's um, it, it's um, It's solely health. S for sugar, O L A I H U W L. Solely Hull. It's actually named after a place. Yeah, no, I I, I did know that. Thank you. I'll I, just, I just quite hear it. I'll just type right, then. in the chat box so everybody's got it. And it's actually worth saying, I'm glad you raised that, Janice. That's actually an area that the, the ambassador group in Drumchapel, um, which is an area of Glasgow in Scotland, um, are focused on. It's one of their key focuses is getting the Sully Hall approach um, across Drum Chapel. So get making sure that all key professionals working with young children and families are trained. The wonderful thing about that particular approach about Sully Hall, and I know it's the reason behind why the Drum Chapel group are so passionate about getting it uh, off the ground there, is you've got this fantastic system where trainers train trainers. So um, the, the, the professionals are trained up, they then uh, pass that information on to parents. Parents become trainers, if you like, and then their job then is to train other parents. And I, I use the word train perhaps loosely amongst uh, amongst people who are not professionally receiving the training. But certainly the idea is that parents are sharing that information with other parents. And so you get this kind of domino effect um, of information sharing across the community between professionals and the parents themselves. So that's a really important point, and I thank you, Janice, for raising that. I think it's the approach that Lil Newton is using as well, which I thought Lil was going to be part of this discussion, which I was really excited about. But she's very hands on with her parents and a range of professionals across the region she works in in Ipswich. So I'd, I'm sure that Lil Newton does uh, follow the Solly Hull approach. Yeah, we were due to be joined by Lil, um, and I did only hear from her a couple of hours back. Maybe some things come up at the last minute, because um, I too was really looking forward to hearing from Lil. 
I think it's probably unlikely she's going to come on at this later stage, but fingers crossed, we never know. Um, I'm just Can I say something? Yes. Can I say something? Can yeah. I say something? I want. I just wanted to say, um, in response to Minnie's comment about schools and people, that I, as an education advisor of 18 years standing, in the last two days I've been into four different schools. If you have a head teacher who understands about child development, you're on a winner because they they listen to everything you've said. And I agree. You, you different education in the classroom. I'm an early years advisor, so I've been in I've been in maybe 12 different reception and nursery classes in the last two days alone. And all I'll tell you is in the school, in the school that's called outstanding and where the head can't bear to not have a high grade in phonics test and high GLD and good outcomes at the end. If she's got a teacher who doesn't, who does it like, like year two, which this teacher does in one of the schools, she can get away with it because Ofsted don't touch it when they come in. And you can't make her think that, that all this stuff is important because she didn't think it. And the truth is, we can empower all the people we want who are low level at the chalk face under under working with children under six or under 10 even. But if we haven't got leadership understanding all of this, if we haven't got head teachers doing this kind of stuff, then actually you won't change what goes on in schools. You have to get Ofsted to believe that these are the most important things. Ofsted have got to say that that's important. I completely agree with absolutely everything you've said. I've given so many keynotes for the Ofsted big conversation as well. We've had Jill Jones there and, you know, standing ovations to what I'm saying. Everyone is on board. But exactly as you and I have identified, if we do not get the understanding from the Department for Education and Ofsted, you know, I feel quite crushed because you're right. Then there's no go. We can make pockets of tiny change, but it's not a complete if you like paradigm shift, a complete shift in understanding of what is the most important for education, you know, for those academic outcomes to happen. I maintain they have it topsy turvy. And of course, if the leadership teams are not seen to be, you know, caring about it, then what am I going to think as a practitioner? It's not important. I don't care for it. It's not on perfect example is the revised early learning goals. And my my big bugbear, that's the third time I've said it, is about the revision they've included self-regulation. But please tell me, where is self-regulation in early years qualifications and training? Nowhere, unless they seek out training for themselves and they pay for this training, like CPD, like I offer, or you know, they happen to hear it at conferences, they don't know what self-regulation is. So they won't know what, how important it is, how to co-regulate and why this is critical across the life course. So you bolting on two sentences about self-regulation and then, you know, reprimanding practitioners, oh, well, you know, you haven't encouraged the children to meet this ELG. It is not just a black and white ELG. It is a critical life skill that so many children do not have. And we are not being equipped to give them that ability to self-regulate. And this is a big issue for me. So I make you right on everything you've said. Okay. I would like your um, speaking. Can I come, can I come in? Governor, Hi. I would endorse the importance of convincing Ofsted of the importance of all we've been talking about. Because no matter how convinced your staff are, and at the school, I'm a governor, the early years staff don't need the persuading of what we've been talking about. But when Ofsted come in and see the wrong numbers, they, the, the conversation stops there. They're all only interested in the numbers. Ofsted are the people who've got to be persuaded. But I would add to that, I am quite surprised by the amount of this conversation which has slid into education. The early years start pre-birth, and it's those early months, those months up, those first 36 months, which are really crucially important. And a lot of, or some of, not a lot, but some of what's been said problems which arose before the kids ever got into school and I think we really should and I, I know many other people agree as well be putting more resource and more focus onto helping parents deal with not creating stressful environments right back in the very early months of life. Andy, thank you. Can I come in? I was just very second I just wanted to pick up on that a little bit um, if I may, no because there's a couple of you that have made that point, and I think, Andy, I thank you for kind of 
redirecting the conversation back to, um, as you say, the earliest years, because of course, there's an awful lot that we should be doing and can be doing way before we get to uh, school age, certainly. Um, although education, of course, has to be involved in the discussion. Um, I'm, I want to pick up on a few points. One is, and I know Solly Hall approach has been mentioned, but but I'm sure there are other ideas that people have in this call. If anybody has any very specific ideas about how we get this information to parents, how we engage parents and how we better educate and inform and involve parents in this discussion so that they do have the right information, they do have access to this information to make the right decisions. Um, and the second question I just wanted to pick up on, or rather the point I wanted to pick up on, is Linda's point here in the chat. Uh, and Linda says, we wanted to set up a Face Your Baby campaign, then found out that buggies that face your baby cost £400 plus. Uh, and Linda, I wonder if you want to just pick up on that a little bit um, on the audio, um, because again, that's going back to engagement, to attunement, attachment, engagement. Either of those points, does anybody want to pick up on them? Hi, it's, yeah. hi, it's Tracy yeah. here. Um, the face-to-face -face, uh, is a, a theme that we've included within our training as well for education. And I think it's important throughout the lifespan. And again, I think, you know, yes, we do need to have these changes higher up in terms of government and Ofsted, etc. But what we can be doing parallel to that in the meantime throughout the child's lifespan is hugely important and it's looking for those opportunities of that important skill sharing so we're thinking about for example the very early years in terms of antenatal classes and having a much more collaborative approach around that um, in terms of the importance of play and um, in terms of the importance of positioning the importance of interactions and they can all be pulled together beautifully you know within that and again it'd be about that skill sharing so you could have for example your your midwives doing the antenatal classes alongside um input again that sort of skills just sort of refined enough so that they're, they're good enough in terms of speech to language physiotherapy occupational therapy for example and having all that information with an antenatal class in terms of starting to build those wonderful play opportunities and for parents to understand the importance of the interactions and play and the face-to-face -face, etc in developing that early nurturing relationship with the child because ultimately a lot you don't know what you don't know in terms of parenting if you haven't been parented in that manner you will not necessarily know how to parent can, in that I, manner. can so, I just say something I'm, a, I'm one of the new ambassadors and I, I'm, I'm doing this because my own ACE score is an eight. I have three kids and I was lost trying to parent small children. And the only reason I got through it is because I went to a GP who explained to me that I had no idea what I was doing. And I was going to need help. And then it was the health visitor who came and helped me. And I think that all these discussions are super academic. And I think that's really impressive. You really need that evidence and you need the passion. But parents actually don't even necessarily know how to access their children and how to do a good job of it. They don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And you need someone like a health visitor. You need someone like a midwife right at the beginning who is monitoring attachment, who is in their home, who can understand their situation because if you can't get to the parents then anything after that is going to be a lot more challenging mm -hmm. thank you can I, I really appreciate what you've said there and, and um it's very similar backgrounds there and having my first and only child was a very painful journey for me in the early days but you know, I, I actually put in a complaint about the mid, uh, the health visitor because there was no eye contact. She failed to see how depressed and lost I was. Yeah. And, it, and I just I felt, my goodness, such a missed opportunity. You know, I couldn't see it then because I was in the depths of despair, which again, when, when this opportunity to be an ambassador came up, I leapt on it and I feel very proud of it because it's us reaching out to members of the public, anyone with an interest really, because those early days, like uh, many colleagues have addressed in this conversation already, those early days when, you know, the baby's in utero, even from then the stress levels are being formed because of mum's stress levels, whether there's yeah. depression, what the environment is like outside of the tummy, 
all of the impacts inside and, and that baby is already born, let's say, wired for stress, but that cortisol is cranked up to 100 already without even having experienced the world or other human beings. And I think great training, not just for early practitioners, but like you said, for health visitors and midwives, not just about the technicalities and the tick box, which he ticked in front of me and didn't barely talk to me, but about the interaction, the connecting, how is mum feeling? How are you coping? It's okay to be a mess. It's okay to be in tears. Share that. There was no remit for me to do that. And my first years as a mum, my one time as a mother, were ruined. I had nobody around me, no family, no professionals that connected with me. And I think this needs to be changed. But like you say, it has to be a rethink of how training is written and delivered. Welcome in. I'd like to make a comment, if I may. Of Alex. I'm going to, I'm going to welcome oh. Alex, then I'm going to welcome from Linda and then Lydia. Thank you. Okay, sure. You had indicated that the conversation moved on from what I wanted to discuss, but I'll, I'll bring it back and see where we go. Um, a couple of the callers earlier on were saying that the Department for Education and the Department of Health don't, don't seem to be picking up on this. Um, and in direct response to that, the, the select committees, I won't, I won't bore everyone the intricacies of politics, but effectively there's committees that review the work of these, these various departments. And they released a report um, in response to the government's uh, green paper, uh, the government's green paper, Transforming Mental Health. And this, this paper that the, the select committees uh, brought he criticised the government for having nothing to say about mental health in the preschool environment and the fact that the government didn't seem to have any awareness about what adverse childhood experiences were or how they are the drivers of mental health problems. So the committee is actually the committee is actually beginning to speak the same language that we are. So there is there is work being done. I know it's very slow, but these things obviously have certain me mechanisms that they have to move through. But there are conversations being had in, in very high levels of parliament precisely around ACES. So there are green shoots there. So please, please, please do recognise that things are happening. Thank you, Alex. Well said. Um, Linda, please. It's OK. I haven't got a lot to add. It was just the, with the um, Face Your Baby campaign. We, when we ran the conference last year, Mental Health Starts in the Womb, there was two key things that came out of it. And one was routine inquiry of ACEs and trauma-informed communities and the other one was a face your baby campaign and then when we started going into it in some detail we found out that there was quite a lot more to it and the one thing we didn't want to do was increase inequalities and one of the barriers to that was these you know all these push chairs and buggies that face away from the baby so i think if we do build this into antenatal classes and um, around by us it's the health visitors who run antenatal classes now um, I think we need to make sure that we make sure there's no enhancing of inequalities when we run a campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you, Linda. Lydia. I just wanted to make a comment about um, knowledge and training and being given to parents. I think this needs to start a lot, lot earlier in, in um, sex and relationships education and um, PSHE both you know throughout the school years that children well before they're in get you know entering into parenthood need to have a better understanding about um, about infant brain development and about the central role of of parents in in um, in developing their children's brain through you know the cuddles and the, all those things that are are so vital in those very early years and months and until we 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 empower parents i think we're we're not going to sort of grasp this and we we need to really raise the profile of of the role of being a parent and rather than professionals telling them how to do it it's about informing them and encouraging them and supporting them in a very practical way Thank you, Lydia. I agree. I realise I agree. I think it has to be on such a. I'm terribly sorry. I can't hear very well. I'm sorry if I interrupted anybody. Have I interrupted anyone? It's all right. I was just going to see if Laura was able to come in there because I'm not sure if Laura is still having issues with her 
audio, but um, I know she's really keen to share some thoughts. And as one of our guests, I'm keen to, to allow her the time to do so. Laura, are you um, are you able to come in? No, I think Laura's still having issues with her audio. So, Mini, please go ahead. I was just going to say, and I don't mean to offend anybody, and, and I'm sorry, we all have different ways of approaching, uh, you know, trying to tackle what we believe is right for the welfare of babies and children. And I think, and I know this is going to sound wrong to a lot of you, and I'm, I'm sorry, but in a way I'm, I'm not sorry, because I don't mean to offend by doing it. But, you know, when I see, for example, parents on the street just outright ignoring their children, uh, you know, I, off, I do have a tendency to approach them, not in a patronising, harsh way, but just like, hey, you know, how are you? Do you need any help? You look really stressed. And, and surprisingly, they open up like a flower and it's, oh, you know, and then they very quickly start talking about their days and why they're upset and they feel stressed or, you know, their child's got autism and they can't manage it. They're not being told enough. Uh, information clearly from the doctors it's so many examples I could tell you but what I'm waffling on to say and I am sorry it's because I get so passionate is we shouldn't be afraid to approach parents and we shouldn't be afraid to say the things that need to be said like um, with the press, uh, forward facing buggies you know the the, the holders on so many buggies now for tech devices which I think is downright wrong you know, um, excessive adult time on, on phones, on tech devices, therefore allowing your child to just run free with undetermined tech devices. All of these things detract from human connection. And I think we need to be brave and bold to understand no. our approach to, uh, I don't want to say educating parents because we've got our own styles and our reasons for our styles, but just you know, to put child well-being at the heart of everything we do and how we want to convey our messages to parents and why. We, we should be a bit braver, I think, in my opinion and experiences. Okay, thank you. Um, who's got any thoughts on that? Well, I'd say that um, I have some thank thoughts you. on it, actually, Sarah. Yes, who's this? It's Sandra. Hi, Sandra. I, I think the I think the thing is is that you know I'm a teacher, okay, and a lot of the advice I would give to parents would be actually about their parenting style and about fostering attachment when there's issues to do um, with children. Um, however, one has to be very very careful because um, there's a fine line because parents can actually see it as being intrusive. The other thing is it can come across as patronising, even if it isn't meant to be patronising. But the reality is they take it as a personal attack. I know from my experiences of working in um, both the Netherlands and also from my experience of my family in Canada, they're very much at the forefront in, in encouraging parenting courses actually in high school, okay, in secondary schools. So as a result, children have more of an, well, you know, young adults, I suppose is the best way of describing them, have more of, of an understanding of the importance of attachment when um, before they even become parents. And I think that's where we actually need to go. I think you need to start tapping it at various levels. One is within secondary school. I mean, within the UK, it's the PSHE programme. In Ireland, it's the SPHE programme. And then also at antenatal classes. But I also think when kids, before they even come to school, there should be some, some, some form of information program actually uh, given to the parents about their role in actually fostering attachment to the importance of play and the importance of conversation. And I'm totally um, on board the whole issue of technology. The number of times I've actually seen parents give a very young child under one a mobile phone to play with, I mean, doesn't actually foster any form of connection. In fact, you know, it actually create, creates disconnection and it absolutely horrifies me. Yeah, I think that's... I, I agree with all you say, um, you know, we're, we're seeing six month olds being, you know, given, uh, you know, little tablets, I don't even know what they're called because I don't use them, to hold if they get a bit grisly or, you know, they want attention and, and, and parents aren't paying attention and, and I, th I find it absolutely tragic. Also, just to address your point, I, I'm never patronising, I do understand, you know, it can be deemed that way, but I think I reach out as a parent who struggled in those early years and I feel like I was robbed and if I feel like if only someone said to me are you all right 
how you, you know, I never had it. And I suppose that's why I reach out. And it's never to the detriment of the parent. And I've only ever had them thank me ultimately. Of course, you know, if you roll it out with more people, it could change. I get that completely. But I just think, you know, with the advance of tech devices and how easily and readily they're being consumed, I do think a lot more education needs to be given to alerting parents to the dangers of it because it it's taking away like we have said a few times the human connection and then we wonder why children behave the way they do or they're not demonstrating pro-social skills and I think this has a lot to do with it and we have the power to change it and I just think we need a bit more help or input from the government to do so. Thank you. We need Hi it's Alex. Sorry Alex, it's Alex I've got Kevin waiting to come in. I've got Kevin waiting to come in. Thank you. I give way. <laughs> Thank you, Hi, can you. Hi, can you hear me? Definitely. Hi, Kevin. Hello. Yeah, just listening, um, it's, it's fascinating because I, it, it's kind of, it highlights to me this swamp of public information and public uh, beliefs around what's good and what's not good. And it gets really, really difficult for parents and for often professionals to know whether to pick up on this program or that program and it almost becomes competitive because people are so insecure in, in their roles no more so than a parent because they constantly feel vulnerable constantly feel judged and I one one thing that I highlighted that I thought was really good uh, Nadine Burke Harris mentioned that primary care and postnatal and antenatal classes if they're seen individually they get 10 minutes but if they go in in groups of six or eight sure. get the connection of other people and they can sometimes get an hour of support and helping them to connect and speaking about attachment and speaking and I just think it's a much more uh, useful and, and worthwhile way of, of, of getting information into people okay I'll back out <laughs> thank you Kevin thank you very much for contributing Alex come in thank you Hello, sorry, did you did you just call, call me in? Yes, please. I was going to say that they've done scientific studies of long-term exposure to mobile phones, and it has the equivalent on, on the adult brain of long-term crack, crack cocaine use. So effectively, using a mobile phone over extended periods of time and the same effect as... And or pathways are there. So imagine how much more damaging it is for the infant brain, which which is yet to form the synaptic connections. And that that's that that is the danger which was alluded to previously. Uh, if, our, if, it's, if it's doing this to our brains, imagine what it's doing to brains that aren't yet set in their ways. Absolutely, you are bang on, and there's lots of scientific evidence to prove that young brains are being wired for addiction. You know, but as yeah. long as everyone's well, occupied, our brains, it doesn't matter. If our brains, yeah, absolutely. That, all that, all that architectural structure and that framework is, is already set. Imagine how much worse it is for the, a brain that isn't yet I set or fit in structure. And yeah, I completely agree with you. The evidence is out there, and I think we need to get this to well, ours, you know, we need to understand it better, but also alert parents to the dangers. I don't think they get it fully, and they need to be. Mm made aware for their children's well-being not because you have to do it because we said so it's it's for our well-being yeah i mean obviously we're we're coming we're all in this campaign to try and make a you know make a better life i don't think any of us truly believe that parents are deliberately abusing or neglecting or hurting their children i don't think any, anyone feels that you know parents are waking up in the morning and say you know what this is I, i'm bored for a couple of hours let, let's hurt my child or something we, we all recognize here that there is there is you know, there's there's a lack of intent here, and with the right guidance and support, most of these problems can be resolved. I completely agree. I think you know, just like a bad diet, you know, we're alerting them to the dangers of that. I think this should yeah. be on an easy path. I'm, I'm yeah. going to come in here quickly because I am aware that we've got nine minutes left before we need to leave this evening's call. And um, listen, there's obviously an absolute wealth of knowledge here. There always is, um, and this conversation could go on forever and I would gladly listen to it but uh, you must have some of your evening back so I'm going to redirect the conversation a little bit to uh, going back to our ambassador roles and again some of you on this evening's call are not yet ambassadors although we'll hope you'll join the network 
Um, but for many of you on the call, you are in your local communities. Uh, you are promoting uh, the, the, the campaign's ethos and messaging around preventing and addressing child maltreatment and other adverse childhood experiences. And a lot of that is what, what activities can we do within our communities to better engage everyone in the community and what role can we give them to play? And so what I would like to do for the last bit of our conversation is to hear from some people around their ideas of, and I know, Linda, you've shared some ideas there, and I think your point there is really uh, worth echoing, which is this idea of let's not solely rely on the government to do wonderful work, although as Alex has uh, highlighted, we're now getting places uh, with government, both down in Westminster and up here in Scotland. Um, and I want to just touch on that very quickly because there's been a bit of progress today up here in Scotland uh, in government on the issue of ACEs. Um, but it, it's worth remembering that there's an awful lot we can do without waiting for government to make these changes. And Linda's idea here is looking at working with a company like Mothercare to fund a campaign. Um, uh, like the, the baby facing campaign, for example. So, you know, I just want to kind of, for the last five minutes or so of the discussion, what ideas are coming to people's minds around the types of actions, types of people, perhaps, the engagements that they might be, you know, you might go on to have now following this conversation around early years? What opportunities do we see for making some change in our communities? Sarah, it's Linda. Can I jump in? Please do. Um, I mean, obviously, I put something on the 7030 Facebook page that we had 170 professional and community members to our um, two screen showings this week. And um, just from showing the film, we're now going to have trauma-informed police, trauma-informed education. The children's services are going to go back and talk about routine inquiry of ACEs of all the parents. And um, we've got all these churches on board. Rosemary talked to 40 ministers last week. And so the churches are all inviting us in and lots of them run toddler groups. So just reaching out to the community. I mean, we haven't had any um, support from press, none of the papers, none of the and here. BBC. And you know I'm useless on Twitter and Facebook. But just by word of mouth, the community are really jumping at talking about uh, brain development and ACEs. So I, I just really wanted to ha that to be a bit of inspiration for anybody else because it's been a lot of work, but the reward has, has been tenfold just in two days. That's all I wanted to say. Linda, I've not managed to speak to you since you shared that um, on the on the closed Facebook group for ambassadors. So con huge congratulations and uh, you well deserve it because I know the, how hard you work um to, to get that going so fantastic so well done Thank i'm just you. Sarah, a comment you? from i'm just reading a comment from sandra uh, she's actually sent it to me in private but I, I think that's been a mistake she says hospital information leaflets given to pregnant mums and dads well there's one idea for you andy uh, thanks this is something you've heard me say before but maybe some others haven't it's always struck me that the place that this information really starts to need to be shared is at school level. And in PSHE lessons in years sort of 12 and 13, that, that's not something which, um, the, um, which Ofsted are particularly concerned about, but they do like to see PSHE happening in schools. And that is a place where I'm sure teachers would appreciate additional resource to introduce to students the sort of topics that we're talking about and i'm sure i'm sure that between us we as ambassadors could put together a curriculum of half a dozen um, sort of model lessons which we can put out there for teachers to use and that's a zero cost intervention that's not something which would cost the government anything to implement. It wouldn't cost the schools anything to implement. The teachers are already there, the students are already there. And it would be a zero cost way of getting information out at the most critical stage. I think that's a fantastic idea. I'm just reading some messages in response to that, Andy, uh, and people are absolutely agreeing. So what would be the best way to take something like that forward then? I mean, initially I kind of thought, is that something for us to share across party groups? 
in Westminster and Scottish Government or is this something that you think between us we should work on uh, for the time being? But could I mention something here? It's Lydia yeah. talking. Sure. Um, the Brainwave Trust, which is a, an organisation in um, New Zealand, a New Zealand-based organisation, already has a programme of working in schools to, to, to teach about attachment and brain development to um, youngsters in, in secondary school. Um, there are these materials already around, uh, and rather than sort of reinventing the wheel, um, it might be worth looking and thinking about that. But I absolutely support what um, Andy has just said. Do you think the top walk? Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. Yes, some really great ideas. I'm just trying to keep up with this catalogue this evening. There's so much going on here and um, there's some fantastic ideas coming from this discussion. So I think um, I think what I'll do is uh, when I put out my email to you all uh, with the recording and, and messaging, I'll include in, in, in perhaps a bullet point um, format those kind of key ideas that we've got and as a network then we can see about how we take that forward. Um, you know these co these calls are, are here for people to learn and for people to meet each other and for people to share information but uh, beyond that my real, my real hope for these calls is that action comes of them and I know there is so much good work going on in communities across the UK not just um, through the work of 7030. There are many, many people doing fantastic work. And we certainly saw that at our ACES conference in Glasgow last week. So, um, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying that work isn't already being done. Linda, your example there is, is, is a perfect example of the amazing work that's going on in communities um, as a direct result of the work that you guys are doing on the ground. So um, that, that I recognise. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of hoping with the themed calls that we really focus in on a particular area related to this campaign and we work out as a team how we best actively make a change in our communities. So this kind of discussion now I think is really positive because we've got some concrete examples of things, some fantastic ideas of things that we can take forward and at the very least explore how we can how we can progress with them. So I'll certainly pop them an email and uh, the WAVE team, I will take it back to the WAVE team. There's a few things in there I know um, WAVE will be very particularly interested in. Um, and, and just to pick up on the cross-party group, the parliamentary work that we're doing and we're involved in, uh, some of you are on the cross-party group in Scotland uh, and some of you have attended cross-party group meetings down in Westminster. Uh, so this won't be news to you. We recently had our second official meeting of the cross-party group on ACES in Scottish Parliament. Um, our first we had John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister, attend. And the second, again, was on trauma-informed schooling. And one of the things that has been suggested is that we go to Ofsted uh, with data, uh, with backed-up evidence to see that well-being and health uh, both mental, physical health, emotional health, needs to be a predictor of uh, outcomes uh, for uh, schools in Scotland. So it is something that's being discussed. I also just wanted to share with you, because it's only just been announced in the last couple of months, uh, I think also George Hosking from WAVE were at the SNP conference earlier this morning in Glasgow, and we hosted an event uh, for SNP members on adverse childhood experiences. Uh, we had about 35. Oh, we've got a lot of background noise, Sand. I think that's you. Uh, we had 35 people attend around about um, who were all incredibly engaged with the, the topic of discussion around ACEs. And since then, Gail Ross, who's the MSP for Caithness, has uh, put across a motion asking for SNP government to commit to making Scotland a nice nation. And as part of that, as their first action towards that goal, um, conducting an ACE-specific study uh, on the prevalence of ACEs in Scotland. And I'm delighted to say that it's been passed unanimously. 
and that is going ahead in Scotland. And I know a study has been conducted in other parts of the UK, so we have finally caught up and it's taking place. So it's a fantastic news today for Scotland, but as I say, lots of fantastic things going on around ACEs across the country. Um, we have come to the end of this evening's call. There has been so many things that I need to pick up on from this discussion. I thank you all very much for joining us. And if anybody, uh, particularly guests, but anybody has anything that we feel we weren't able to add to this discussion and would like to, um, please do tell me so that I can allow you the space through emails to engage with everybody further than this conversation allows us to do so. Does anybody have any Sorry, last yeah. thoughts before we go? Yes, hey, Sally, can I update where we are politically? Go ahead. Okay, at the, at the close of play today, we're seeing 158 members of parliament. If we can get to 163, then we actually have a quarter of the total of MPs in Westminster. So we have, we'll have 25% of Parliament signed up to the 70-30 goal, which, you know, considering where we were six, nine months ago, is a really incredible achievement. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well done, Alex. Good man. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, everyone. Yeah, I think we have come to the end of the, the call, so I'll let you all escape and enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, but thank you very much again, particularly to our guests. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion. Next month, the theme has not yet been confirmed. I do have a few suggestions from ambassadors, but if you haven't yet put in your suggested themes and you have some ideas or topics of discussion for the next few calls, please do email me or post it in the closed Facebook group and I'll make sure to shape our calls around uh, those particular. Thank you, everyone. Thank you as well. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks for joining us. Cheerio. Bye, Linda. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Tracy.